would like to share with you the story of the IBM Pro Printer. It's more, however, than a story about just a little printer. It's a story about a process, a process which we've come to call Designed by IBM, a process which we've called the Charlotte Story, a process called Designed for Manufacturability, and moreover, a process called Made in America. In 1981, <coughs> the personal computer industry was born in IBM. In 1981, however, we saw that the forecast for all of the personal computers was probably going to be around 250,000. Well, we've seen how short-sighted that was, because today we've sold millions of personal computers. But going back to 1981, when we saw that we had 250,000 personal computers, we needed a printer to go with them a printer priced in the five to $700 range. And looking at IBM's product line, the lowest price printer that we had was about $5,000, not $500. We had no printer at the low end. Now we needed to sit back and say, well, for 250,000 personal computers, is it worth it to go through all of the capital investment, design, release, and tooling to design our own printer? Or was it all right to source it offshore? and we made a decision to source the first IBM personal computer printer offshore. However, as we saw this industry growing, we had to sit back and make another decision. And in 1982, we began thinking about how would IBM strategically enter the low-cost printer industry. And then we went to school on other industries for what has happened in TVs, in textiles, in automobiles, in steel, in cameras, watches, VCRs, is that once we start moving labor offshore, we start moving the investment for that labor offshore, and that investment gets turned around to research and development offshore, which leads, as in the TV industry, to products coming from offshore. And those products coming from offshore then starts a decay in the basic research and development in America. And that whole equation would say that if we kept in the offshore investment business, we would lose the skill ever to get in the onshore investment business in the low-end printers. So in 1982, we spread out competitive products and looked at how they were manufactured, 150 parts to 200 parts. And we said, now how are we going to get that labor content down to where we can build competitive printers onshore? And the answer was to go from 200 parts down to 50 parts. Well, we saw that the price of these products was going to hover in the $500 range and remain flat over time as we look from 1982 out to 1988. We saw that an emerging set of technologies were going into the entry and low usage printers. We saw in 1983 that we had 9 to 18 wire matrix, inkjet, some thermal technology. But as we moved over time, we saw an improvement in quality from 9 to 18 to 24, an improvement in inkjet, and an improvement in thermal transfer. So anything that we did with respect to one product had to be expanded to a wide and a narrow carriage and hold a variety of technologies because we couldn't see exactly where it was going. So that became a challenge, to have flexibility in the design so that we could accommodate an ever-changing environment. That became the vision, the vision of a product, a product that had fewer than 50 or 60 parts, that therefore had to be able to be assembled without screws and fasteners and springs and belts and pulleys. That was the vision. We didn't know how to reach it yet, but we felt that with a vision and a proper commitment and basically staffing with people who didn't know that it couldn't be done, that we could then move forward and build a reality. And that's the way we started in January of 1983. In considering design for manufacturability, of which this was a profound exercise, we thought about reducing parts and mechanism and improving ease of assembly. Because basically, that concept of a one-arm, two-fingered, no vision, limited sense of touch assembly process dictates that a few number of parts and simple assembly without moving the product was paramount such that we could take the labor piece of this product cost equation and reduce it as close to zero as we possibly could. So we looked at the rules that are written in the book, the rules about layered design with a clamshell 
base and sequential assembly in one directional type of assembly. We looked at part self-aligning so that shafts could go into chamfered holes. We looked at uh, combining detailed parts into moldings and castings. And instead of the classic belt and pulley drive systems, we thought about using helical drive systems and gears, about which we'll talk shortly. Ongoing, we thought about common fasteners where we would mold into the base the snaps instead of using C-clips and screws. We'd minimize springs, mold them in where necessary, and use leaf and compression springs instead of the extension coil springs that uh, had to be pulled over posts and are, are difficult to manually assemble. We wanted to minimize cables such that fastener, or that the cables would fasten to the card right where the component was, and we'll show you that in the assembly shortly. And eliminating all adjustments was our goal. As you'll see, we came one adjustment short of that goal, but a profound step in terms of printer design, nonetheless. In terms of the product, from that vision, we then thought about enhancements such as ease of paper handling so that one could have uh, continuous forms in the printer while uh, sheets are fed in at one time. We thought about a very user-friendly kind of a product that could handle envelopes and uh, gum labels and easy access to all the operator panels. And that was the vision, 50 parts and a very user-friendly design with a high-function, high-quality product. We have things in IBM we call performance plans. And our performance plan that each of us adopted was one depicted by this symbol. No belts and pulleys, no screws, no springs. And it became sort of an intrinsic motivator within the group to be able to complete this product without the first person raising his hand and saying, I have to put in a spring or a fastener or a belt or a pulley. That became the fundamental design for assembly goal as we developed the ProPrinter. The first schematic that we had is depicted with this uh, schematic that says, uh, we started with a base, we had a ribbon, we had a platen, we had a pin feed mechanism, and we had a printer assembly. That then led to a concept of let's start with the base on which we will locate all of the parts. Start from the base, put some rubber mounting feet on the base, and then in all of the key locations, have it referenced right off the base and build it up. This slide depicts a buildup of from the base to the ground plane, to the card, to the side frames, up into the pin feed mechanism, and is how that design evolved from that basic concept. The side frames. The side frames were tightly held tolerance plastic parts, the likeness of which we had very little experience with. We had to very carefully consider these parts in as much as one side frame replaces 14 common parts used in printers. Each one of the surfaces that are referenced in a dark color had to be held within a few thousandths of an inch. The good news is once it was done, it was all in one part. The bad news is it was a very complex uh, design to accomplish with one or two molded parts. The, uh, the detent mechanisms and the, the spring mechanisms and the mounting of the shaft all took place within these side frames. In the uh, side frame, we have a molded spring arm, the one spring that we do have in the Pro Printer. That spring arm is tightly held such that the thickness of that spring has to be held within one or two thousandths of an inch because the spring force itself varies as the third power of that thickness. And in fact, even in the materials themselves, we found we had to uh, put into this polymer material base, we had to impregnate Teflon as well as graphite. Teflon for the bearing material, graphite in terms of carrying out static charge. So there's quite a bit of invention just in these parts. A highly complex design providing a function that allows the spring force of the pressure roll shaft to apply spring force to the paper without actually having uh, a spring in the product. The helix assembly. Here was uh, a difficult task in terms of how can one mold an assembly that will cause the print head to move back and forth and still have that molded assembly without any kind of a, a parting line. Classic molding techniques would say you bring the mold together and you separate it. Well, in that sense, 
the helix assembly would have kind of a blah 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 kind of a uh, intermittent step in the drive. So we brought in consultants, we looked at this, and really rediscovered the process by which phonograph records are made, called an electroform process. And what we actually do is we have a, a mold which is uh, layered with metal, inert metal. We insert a shaft into that mold, flow the plastic, and actually unscrew the part out of the mold. That's the electroform process. And that allows a very high precision movement of the printhead back and forth. Another point, the motor itself. By having a relatively high inertia motor to drive the, the helix, we consider the whole assembly process rather than have a light duty motor that drives a belt and pulley scheme. That motor, when on the helix, assembles with a twist and lock fashion, which I'll show you shortly in the actual assembly. That takes into account an ease of assembly step, which when you take into account the belt and pulley kind of arrangement that has two posts, two pulleys, the belt, the screws, and the adjustment is a far easier uh, return on investment trade-off. The printer mechanism itself comes together as an accumulation of parts, starting with the side frames and having all of the shafts build up to the point where when it's all together, it looks like this. A tightly held tolerance, very structurally sound uh, mechanism, free from all adjustments, all belts, pulleys, and springs. The pin feed assembly was an example of a cooperative effort between automation, manufacturing engineering, and design engineering such that even the center of gravity, which I would show with this pin feed mechanism, even the center of gravity of this part had to be taken into account for how the robot or the person would introduce this into the product, which I'll show you shortly. The automation engineer and the assembly engineering team therefore dictated a great part of this design such that the designer had to accommodate the manufacturing ease of assembly. The team itself that put this product together consisted about one-third of the design team, one-third of the manufacturing engineering team, and one-third assembly team. With only 50 parts, we could have virtually a three-person team on each one of the parts. Another consideration that we had in the design of the Pro Printer was that after the unit was partially assembled, we found it necessary then to mount a pulley on a shaft. Here, necessity became the mother of invention. For what we had, as you recall in the pin feed assembly, we had a pin feed unit that fit into the printer, and then the robots would basically separate the pin feed. Then we had to take and mount a pulley. The way we did this is to have this pulley design such that turned 90 degrees to the shaft, it could be introduced by the robot with a twist and lock and mount in that fashion as opposed to what's very difficult, and that is for pulleys to be slid on the end of a shaft. It's very difficult in robotic assembly to put a pulley on the end of a shaft. That pulley design itself is an example of something that led to a U.S. patent. Just that one part and the way that part twists and locks was an example of some of the inventiveness as a cooperative effort between manufacturing and design engineering working together. One other consideration was the way the covers snapped onto the product. We investigated through various standard agencies like Underwriters Lab, Canadian Standards Association, and BDE in Germany, and other European associations about the safety aspects of the Pro Printer. Remember, we were rather adamant about not putting screws in this product. Actually, while it's under the discretion of these agencies, the basic rule was it had to take a tool such as a screwdriver to, take, uh, to access the electronics. Well, with the no screws in the product idea, we finally developed a way whereby it would take a screwdriver to take the covers apart by having to show these standard people that it took the screwdriver to open the snaps to take it apart. We were that adamant about not having a screw in the product. When you're driven by goals like these, you didn't want to be the first person to say, I had to put a screw in the Pro Printer. So that's the basic assembly sequence as we went through the Pro Printer, the layered clamshell design, the sequential assembly, and some of the 
idiosyncrasies that go along with design for manufacturability. However, a picture is worth a thousand words. So the next thing I would like to do is show you an assembly buildup done by hand of the propaner. We begin with a structural foam base. On the base are located rubber mounting feet on both the top and the bottom for supporting the base as well as supporting some of the subsequent assembly. Also located on the base are important vertical mounting posts and fasteners. The assembly then starts with the mylar ground plane and the electronic card placed over the posts and laid onto the base such that the rest of the mechanism can then be put on. Next comes the transformer, which mounts into side locations with a snapping action rather than with screws, after which the cable electronically affixes the transformer. The next step is the paper entry guide, which locates into a notch and a hole in the structural foam base, such that the notch can be found easily by humans or by a robot and snapped in place. The left side frame is the next part to be assembled. Remember, the left side frame has the intricate pressure roll leaf spring assembly, the detent positions, the flattened mounting points, and all of the shaft locating positions all molded into one part. Already assembled on this with a twist and lock fashion is the paper feed motor assembly and paper feed gears. And that's snapped into the base and the electrical connection is then made. Similarly, the right side frame snaps into the base. Next, we're ready for the feed roll assembly. In the feed roll assembly, the center of gravity of this part also had to be taken into account, for it assembles in a fashion where it's located with an orientation down and then locks in place and flips over under its own weight. The platen which the print head impacts to create the printing operation, snaps in between the side frames. Now the upper entry guide locates with four mounting points also into the base with a snap fashion. The pressure roll goes into the leaf spring assembly with a snapping operation. And now we're ready for the operator panel. Now the operator panel is molded such that it contains rosebud fasteners, which mount into the upper entry guide, and then the electrical connection is made simultaneously with the mounting. It mounts into a key slot and snaps in place. Now the print head, mounted on an eccentric shaft, goes also into the side frames, snaps in place, and the detent position is made. The print head is then moved over to the right side, ready for insertion of the helix drive assembly. Now the helix drive assembly comes pre-assembled with the motor, ready to be mounted into the print head itself. And then there's a twist and lock operation with the motor. That twist and lock operation replaces 9 to 12 screws, lock washers, and nuts with one twist and lock operation. Electrical connection is then made for both the helix motor and the print head directly into the card. Take the carrier guide shaft, mount the shaft, 
next we're ready for the pin feed assembly. Pin feed assembly goes in first on the left side, then on the right with a snap and lock, after which the pin feed is separated. We're now ready to mount the pulley, which as we explained before, must be mounted on this shaft after the shaft is trapped. The way that is accomplished is a turn, twist, and lock operation. <coughs> Next mount the ribbon feed gear and clutch. And now the covers. The covers snap on. take the ribbon feed mechanism. And by the way, in the early 80s, this ribbon feed mechanism had to be threaded by hand. We found that one of the easy operator access features that is liked in the Pro Printer is that that mechanism brings itself into place with just the turning of a, uh, a pulley on the, the ribbon itself. Last, we mount the top access cover. There's a complete printer. And we'll plug it in. Take a sheet of paper and insert it in the uh, front entry slot. Put it in the self-test mode. That's how it's done manually. Now, with a brief video clip, I'd like to show you how robots actually assemble the IBM Pro Printer. Parts flow from the fabrication area to temporary storage in automated stackers, operating under the control of IBM personal computers. Within hours, these parts then move from the stackers via overhead conveyors to the assembly areas as they are needed. The product flows through a series of stations. The first six are used for assembly, each station adding parts to build the product from the base up. Once the product has been assembled, it is transferred to Station 7, where it is automatically tested. At Station 8, the cover is installed and the IBM logo is placed on the product. Once performance standards are verified, the printer is shuttled to the packaging area. End caps are placed on the printer. The unit is boxed, labeled for shipping, palletized, loaded on a trailer, ready for delivery. So the Pro Printer story was one of a tightly integrated organization, manufacturing, manufacturing engineering, a design team literally drinking out of the same coffee machine, sharing office space, and working very closely together. In two and a half years, January 1983 to May of 1985, this complete product was built and being mass produced uh, by IBM. The simple design with basically 60 part numbers, allowed for automation to be introduced, which introduced low cost, which allowed high volumes. The combination of low cost, high volume, and automation are three legs of a stool that are all very dependent upon one another, for without the cost, the volume isn't there, and so forth. Now out of this, we have developed a product family. The Pro Printer was introduced in May of 1985. The Pro Printer XL came uh, virtually a year later. 
And then, subsequently, we have introduced the ProPrinter X24 and the ProPrinter XL24, completing a 9 and a 24 wire family of products. Quality is built in three ways into the ProPrinter. It's built into the parts, in the molding operation with temperature and pressure and product material very sensitively uh, cared for. It's built into the process with assembly, with testing, and with uh, run-in of, uh, of all of the components. And it's built into the field feedback that we get from customers. Quality cards come into us with verification that we've not only met the quality standards that we intended, but we've exceeded them. And we're talking multi-lifetimes between failures on the average. How we stacked up from a scorecard point of view. Remember, we were shooting for 50 parts. We ended up with 60, counting all the foam and line cord and ribbons and things like that. We, our goal was no fasteners, no belt, no springs, no adjustments, and no cables. We scored well on most of these, but ended up with one adjustment between the printhead and the platen. Our goal was to have 77% plastic parts molded in-house, and that's what we achieved. The net story is that when one designs for automation, one designs for manufacturability, because with the, the manual content reduced to a very easy to put together product, it can be done easily with people or with robots. Automation flows very nicely into a 60-part machine in terms of logistics, material handling, packaging, and shipping. The Pro Printer was introduced in May of 1985. Subsequently, it has been recognized by many in the PC industry. Daytech Printout Newsletter gave it the 1984-85 Printer of the Year Award. In the Hanover Fair in early 1986, the Pro Printer was recognized for its good industrial design. PC Magazine honored the Pro Printer at the uh, Spring Comdex in 1986 with its uh, excellence, technical excellence award for business machines. The Plastics World followed with the Excellence in Plastics Design Award in 1986. Plastics Technology gave it the Computer Integrated Manufacturing Award and most recently, the North Carolina Governors and Professional Engineers Award was given to the IBM Pro Printer. Most importantly, however, introduced in May of 85, seven months later, beginning of 1986, the Pro Printer became the best-selling PC attached printer in America. A tribute to all of the customers and all of the dealers that adopted this product so well. We've now followed with the wide carriage ProPrinter XL, the ProPrinter X24, and the XL24, all of which have had fabulous market receptivity. And all of this has been a tribute to a terrific team, a design team, a manufacturing engineering team, an assembly team, working hand in hand with a market product and business planning team to respond to one primary goal, the customer needs.